The Book of Jonah Introduction This introduction to Jonah encompasses Nahum as well, for there were significant similarities between these two prophets. Jonah and Nahum both went to the same place and they both had the same sort of message. Jonah was born near Nazareth. He was a local hero to the people of Nazareth and Jesus must have heard about him when he was a little boy. Of all the prophets, Jesus compared himself to Jonah. Nahum came from Capernaum. Caper means village, so Caper Nahum is named after the prophet. This village was Jesus' main base on the Sea of Galilee, so he had a very close connection with these two prophets. It is especially significant that they came from the north, because this was the intent international part of Israel. It was called Galilee of the Nations, because the crossroads of the world was in Galilee. A road from Europe came down the coast and crossed through the region before heading east to Arabia. The road from Africa came up from Egypt and crossed through Galilee and north to Damascus. So everyone going from Asia to Africa or from Europe to Arabia came through this crossroads. At the crossroads there was a little hill called Megiddo. The hill of Megiddo in Hebrew is Armageddon where the last battle of history will be fought. So Nazareth was on a hill overlooking the crossroads. As a boy, Jesus must have seen many coming and going, rather like travellers passing through an airport lounge. Galilee was very international, whereas up in the hills of Judea in the south, the people were nationalistic, isolated and right off the main routes. So there were two locations within the nation which affected the ministry of Jesus. He was very popular in the international place in the north. He was very unpopular in the nationalist centre in the south, where he was eventually crucified. Jonah and Nahum were northerners, and were therefore very much aware of international affairs, and they were both sent by God to Assyria. The threats to the Holy Land came from the big western and eastern powers. Israel was continually being squeezed between these two power blocks as each tried to overcome the other. Somebody has said about Israel that if you live in the middle of a crossroads, you're bound to get run over, and that's exactly what happened. In the days of Jonah and Nahum, Assyria, with its capital at Nineveh, was the problem. Jonah went to challenge Assyria in the year 770 BC and Nahum went in the year 620 BC. So they were 150 years apart. They were both sent because of the sheer wickedness of the Assyrian people. The Assyrian Empire lasted for about 750 years and at one stage even managed to take over Egypt. It started as a small power in about the year 1354 BC and gradually expanded. But it expanded by means of great cruelty. Indeed the Assyrians were one of the most cruel brutal nations that history has seen. They invented the hideous practice of impaling their enemies on wooden spikes until they died. They used to execute thousands of people at once in this way. They ruled their empire by terror. Nahum called the capital Nineveh, a bloody city, and the name was well deserved. If a nation thought that the Assyrians had their eye on their country, they were mortally afraid of what would happen. Zephaniah also spoke about the Assyrians, but Nahum finally went to them and said, You're finished. God's going to wipe you out. And sure enough, Nineveh fell in the year 612 BC, and the whole Assyrian Empire disappeared five years later, immediately after Nahum's warning. Fact or Fiction Turning to the story of Jonah itself, we must first respond to the huge debate about whether it is fact or fiction. Most people know the book because of the story of Jonah and the whale, and most people's impressions of the book depend on whether or not they believe that the story is true. 
Some say that the incident in which the whale or big fish swallows Jonah is like the story of Pinocchio, who also lived inside a whale. They argue that no one could be expected to take such a fantastic story seriously. Therefore they take it to be a parable with a moral, and offer various options as to the meaning. Some say it was told to challenge the hearers to greater missionary endeavour. It was a reminder to Israel that they had a missionary responsibility to the rest of the world. Jonah's running away from his mission is a moral for Israel to learn from. But when there is a parable in the Bible, it is usually very clearly indicated. Jonah, however, is treated as history. Also, when Jesus told parables, they never contain miracles, and yet there are eight miracles in this story. Other scholars believe that the book of Jonah is an allegory, with every incident corresponding to real life. So Jonah is a personification of Israel, rather as John Bull is of Britain, or Uncle Sam is of the United States. They say that Jonah being swallowed by the whale is a metaphorical picture of Israel being swallowed up in exile. But there are serious objections to treating Jonah as fiction. Number one, the style of the book is exactly the same as all the historical books. Its wording, style and grammar are identical to those of 1st and 2nd Kings. Number two, the book deals with real places and real people mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. Jonah is mentioned in 2 Kings, and so we know that he was a prophet during the reign of Jeroboam II. His father was a Nati, and he is treated as a real person in the historical books of the Bible. Number three. More importantly, Jesus treated Jonah as a real person. He believed in Jonah and the big fish. Jesus said of himself that a greater than Jonah is now here and he likened his own period of death to Jonah's time in the whale. Number four. But above all, the theories claiming that Jonah is a parable or an allegory do not do justice to chapter four. The main question that opens up the message of the book is why did Jonah run away? Many people never even bother to ask the question. Why then are people so eager to treat Jonah as the man who never was? Why are they so reluctant to accept this book as fact? The first objection is that what happened to him was physically impossible. The second is that it was psychologically improbable that one Jewish preacher could convert a huge pagan city. Could we imagine a Jew arriving in the middle of London, preaching in Trafalgar Square and bringing the city back to God? It seems very unlikely that the whole of London would repent. As for the physical impossible, we must first ask, could it happen? Secondly, we must ask, could God make it happen? Is it possible for a man to be swallowed by a great fish or whale? When I was a pastor in the village of Chalfont, St Peter, Buckinghamshire, the local blacksmith had a son who worked with marine mammals in California. He trained a whale and a dolphin who were friends and played together in a large tank. When the dolphin died, the whale wouldn't allow the keepers to touch the body of his dead friend and kept the body of the dolphin in its mouth for three days. It would periodically bring the dolphin above the water to try to get it to breathe again. The blacksmith's son showed us a film he had taken of these three days and the dolphin was just about the size of a man. This incident links with an unusual newspaper story about a whaler named James Bartley who was working off the Falkland Islands. He and three other men were thrown into the sea when a whale came up under their boat. The other men were rescued, but not Bartley. The captain wrote in his log, swept overboard, presumed drowned, James Bartley. Later, they happened to catch the whale that had capsized the boat. As they were cutting it up, they saw something moving inside the whale's belly. They cut it open to find James Bartley in a deep coma. But it was clear that he was still breathing. After a few days, he recovered consciousness and went on to live a normal life. His only handicap was that when, where his skin had not been covered by clothing, 
It had been bleached by the digestive juices of the whale, so he had a very unusual appearance for the rest of his life. So this true story proves that it is physically possible to survive within the belly of a whale. Some Christians seem eager to believe anything. A Salvation Army officer once said that if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed the whale, he'd believe it. But this kind of blind faith just draws ridicule from the world. All things are possible with God, but the Bible doesn't ask you to believe the absurd. Dead or alive? The key question for me is whether Jonah was dead or alive. I had never asked myself that question until I saw the film of the whale with a dolphin in its mouth trying to get it to breathe again. But when I reread the book of Jonah, to my astonishment I found that all the evidence points to the fact that the whale picked up a dead body. If you read chapter 2, you discover that Jonah was actually drowned. We read that when the sailors threw him into the sea, he sank to the bottom of the sea and lay there at the roots of the mountains, with his head in the seaweed. It takes only about a minute and a half to drown, and it takes much longer than that to reach the bottom of the sea. Sunday school materials mistakenly picture the whale floating around on the surface with its mouth open when the sailors threw him overboard. None picture him as the Bible does, lying in the seaweed at the bottom of the Mediterranean. Furthermore, the prayer which he prays tells us that he is in Sheol, the abode of the dead. He describes his last moment of consciousness, when his life was ebbing away and the waters engulfed him. He says that at the time he remembered the Lord. So as all the evidence points to Jonah having died, it seems that the whale does not lead to Jonah's survival, but to his resurrection. When the whale spewed him up, God reunited his spirit and body. This ties in with Jesus' statement that just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so he would be in the heart of the earth. Worldly skeptics would find it easier to believe that Jonah was swallowed and remained alive in the whale than the idea that he died and was resurrected. I believe that Jonah is the most outstanding example of resurrection in the Old Testament. Miracles The interpretation of the book of Jonah leads us to face bigger questions about our belief in God. In this book it is not just the swallowing of, whale, of Jonah by a whale that we have to come to terms with, but a total of eight physical miracles, including a far bigger miracle than the one that most people associate with the book. In the last chapter, God tells a worm to do something. The blacksmith's son in California could train whales quite easily. They are highly intelligent mammals. But I've never seen anyone train a worm. But God tells a worm what to do. If anybody says to me, you, you don't still believe that story about Jonah and the whale, do you? I say that's nothing. I believe the story about the worm too. They usually look quite blank because they have no idea what I'm talking about. Let us briefly consider the miracles in this book. Number one, God sends a wind that causes a storm and the ship is in danger. Number two, when the sailors cast lots to find out who is the cause of divine anger, they identify Jonah. God has controlled the outcome of an apparently random selection. Number three, when the sailors throw Jonah overboard, God calms the sea. Number four, God sends the great fish to swallow Jonah's body. Number five, God makes the great fish vomit the body onto dry ground. Number six, God makes a vine, a castor plant from which we can get castor oil, grow overnight. Number seven, God sends a worm to eat the roots of the plant so that it dies. Number eight, finally God sends a hot scorching desert wind. So on eight occasions, God controls nature. How we react to these events tells us a lot. There are three philosophies that are widely held in the UK. Number one, atheism. It says that God didn't create the world and therefore he doesn't control it. Number two, deism. is a more commonly philosophy which holds that God created the world but that he can't control it now. I would say that many people in British churches are deists, which means that they can't believe in miracles, 
So they go to church and thank God that he is the maker of heaven and earth, but they won't pray about the weather. Number three, theism is a biblical philosophy which says that God not only created the world in the past, but also controls it now. Of course, there are some Christians who combine two of these philosophies. They believe in miracles in the Bible, but they don't believe that they happen today. They are practical deists and theoretical theists. Convert in Nineveh. Let us turn next to the psychological improbability that an enormous city like Nineveh would convert. Here are some arguments in favour of this being a historical fact. Number one. First, they were religious and even superstitious. They actually believed in God. Number two, they were guilty. Guilt makes cowards of all of us. So when they were accused of what they had done, they knew it and were prepared to own up. Thirdly, the revival started at the bottom among the ordinary people and worked its way up to the palace. Fourthly, they had the sign of Jonah. If Jonah's skin was white from his time in the whale, he must have been quite a sight. No doubt his explanation of what had happened to him made a big impression on them. And fifthly, above all, when the Holy Spirit works, things happen. I don't have any difficulty in believing that the whole city repented. Jesus certainly believed it when he said that the people of Nineveh will rise up on the day of judgment because they repented when they heard about God and his hearers did not. Why did Jonah run away? But there is a big question that we have not yet considered in detail. Why did Jonah run away from his task? This is the subject of chapter 4, which is rarely taught, preached or even read. Yet it is the very heart of this little story. Why was Jonah so reluctant? Who was he thinking about? Some people say he was thinking primarily of himself. He was just scared to go to Nineveh. He feared being impaled as an enemy of Assyria. This doesn't explain why he suggested that the sailors throw him into the sea. He wasn't afraid of death as such. Secondly, people say he thought that the Gentiles had no right to hear about the God of Israel. It was a kind of reverse of anti-Semitism. We might call it anti-Gentilism. But this doesn't explain why he fled away to the Gentiles in Tarsus. Others say that he was thinking of the Assyrians, the wickedest people on earth. And yet more than that, he was really thinking of Israel, because Assyria was the biggest threat to little Israel, and he didn't want to have anything to do with this potential invader. None of these solutions take into account the words of Jonah in the last chapter. He had told the people of Nineveh that in 40 days God will wipe out their city. The result of his preaching was that all the people repented. Disaster was averted. An evangelist would be thrilled if the whole city repented, but Jonah was disappointed. He sat on a hill outside the town and said to God, I told you this would happen. I know what you're like. I knew you'd let them off. I knew you would just threaten them with destruction, then fail to go through with it. Doesn't Jonah want people to be saved? Is he so narrow-minded and so bigoted that he doesn't want people to repent? The key is his reference to what he had said to God in his own country. O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Chapter 4, verse 2. We must look to Second Kings 14, verse 23 to 25, to find out what had happened to Jonah in his own land. When he was called to be a prophet, he was sent to the king Jeroboam the second of Israel, a notoriously bad king who did evil in the sight of the Lord. When God told Jonah to go to the king, Jonah responded positively at first, expecting to be able to deal with the king's wickedness. But the message that Jonah was given was not what he had expected. The Lord said, go and tell the king that I want to bless him, that I'm going to enlarge his borders and make him great. Jonah protested that he was a wicked king and that this was the wrong approach. 
He was saying to the Lord in his heart, It'll never work, Lord. If you bless bad people, they just get worse. Indeed, the king did get worse. The more the Lord blessed him, the worse he got. So Jonah came to the conclusion that mercy doesn't change wicked people. Jonah is telling God that he knows God's business better than God himself does. God's compassion. So this past episode coloured Jonah's attitude as he went to Nineveh. He said, let's just see what happens, Lord. I'm going to watch this city and see whether you're... Letting them off will cure them or not, whether they got better or worse. Underlying all this is Jonah's jealousy for the Lord's character and reputation. He could not cope with anyone taking advantage of divine mercy. He believed their repentance was superficial and would not last. He thought that if God was too soft with them, they would conclude that he never carries out his threats of judgment. Jonah's warning would be doubted, even ridiculed and eventually forgotten. When the plant grew up alongside him, he was very thankful for it, since it gave him shade from the sun. When the worn worm ate the roots, it died, and Jonah was very angry again. He asked God why he caused it to die. God told Jonah that it was legitimate for him to be angry about the plant, but did he have a right to be angry about Nineveh? There were over 120,000 children in the city and many cattle too. Didn't God have a right to have a heart for them? So although Jonah was jealous for the Lord in not wanting to see the Assyrians escape punishment, he did not understand God's compassion. He said a sire to postpone punishment as long as possible. That was why he ran away to sea, and that was why for him the success of his preaching was so hollow. We too sometimes forget how patient God is, and how full of mercy he is, and how many chances he wants to give people. There is a time, of course, when God's patience runs out. This is ultimately the message of the prophets. Jonah just got the timing wrong. In his day it was still the time of God's mercy and patience with Nineveh. But that patience would not last forever, as we shall see when we study the prophecy of Nahum.